Hi, I'm Tom. Uh, you've probably already met me. Um, I should actually introduce myself. I am a senior developer for Kraken Technologies. You've probably seen uh, Constantine. You've probably seen Constantine. I have, um, I have this guy as a prize uh, at a certain point in my talk. Um, so I started my career as sort of a sysadmin slash dev and then sort of a dev slash sysadmin. And, and nowadays that's kind of all under the DevOps kind of grab bag of poorly defined experience. Um, I spent a lot of time building complex multi-service or multi-component systems and then spent more time trying to work out what they're actually doing and why they're broken. Uh, I'm not a part of the open telemetry team or the project. I just wanted to talk about it and then they let me talk about it. Uh, so I'm telling you this sort of as a developer who's used the project and is sort of excited about what it's achieving. So in a way, this is just a long lightning talk and so Chris can't really berate me for going over time. Although I can berate me for going over time. Okay, but give me more than five minutes. So a lot of us work in the web app development space, like not all of us, but a lot of us do. And all of us just come up with more and more ways of working out what our apps are actually doing. So I kind of want people to sort of hands up if they've got the, these things in their, in their app or more of them. So you've probably got logging. And then maybe you probably moved on to structured logging. Um, you probably, if you use Django, you're probably used to that old Django system of like emailing you stack traces. Uh, who here has a beard as gray as mine or grayer and has used Nagios? Yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's the bold and gray ones. Um, or Rollbar or Sentry, lots of people using that. Then you probably have bespoke dashboards and then you probably have log aggregation and CloudWatch going on. You probably have weird Slack workflows that alert you to certain conditions. I know there's plenty of people in this room who have exactly systems like that. And then maybe if you're like me, you have musical interfaces that play relaxing ocean sounds in real time when user events happen, um, which is actually something I've done. So this is a talk about open telemetry, and you can probably see where I'm going with this. Guess which XKCD cartoon I'm about to show, and if you can tell me the number of that XKCD cartoon, you get an octopus. Who knows which number of which comic I'm about to show you? No, it's not 476. No, it's, you're close. Yeah, it's the standards one, but what number is it? Nine birds who use... He's really close. 927, well done. Was that you, Hugh? Was that you, Hugh? Cool, you got an octopus. <laughs> okay. This is the one that I've memorized. Everyone has XKCD comics that they've memorized because they have to refer to them so often, and this is my one. There are, this is a standard because we had 14 competing standards and now we have a 15th one. So what is open telemetry and which part of this wider mess is it actually trying to solve? Okay, so first of all, open telemetry, it's, it's a whole taxonomy of definitions and jargon and vocabulary so that for one thing, what people mean when they say words like log metric, uh, resource, attribute, span, transaction, collector, uh, we can all know that they sort of mean the same thing. So that's, that's actually quite a lot of value in itself when all of these things have different jargon for things. It's a wire protocol. Okay, so it's a standard wire protocol for three types of signals, for logs, metrics, and traces, so that all the tools that want to send those or receive those can intercommunicate. Um, it's a set of libraries in a whole bunch of programming languages that all have a very standard, well-defined API so that if you've instrumented a project in Python, you'll find that instrumenting it in TypeScript works almost the same way, notwithstanding language features that might not be in one of them, like sort of context managers or something, but the libraries have standard names and the functions in them have standard names. It's a huge set of automatic instrumentation for common libraries and frameworks in that language so that if you're using a whole lot of frameworks that you're probably familiar with, like Django and Django and like, well, you know, lots of them. Uh, basically, all, all, the, all the main ones you can think of, you get a huge amount of instrumentation for free. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay. I mentioned metrics, logs, and traces. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what they are for the most, well, a little bit. Logs, you already know what logs are. They print shit out. They usually have a timestamp on them. If you're lucky, they have more structure. Metrics are numbers and measurements and like 
this page was hit 10,000 times, and this page was hit 10,000 times. The useful way of knowing if it's a metric and not like a trace is if you can aggregate them and get useful data out of it, you got 10,000 hits over here and 10,000 hits over here, you aggregate them, it's 20,000 hits, you know that that means something. And then traces are events that have a start and finish and have sub-events. It's basically a tree of things that happened and when. There's more detail to it than that, but you'll see what I mean in a second. Uh, I have a diagram. I copied this diagram. This is stolen from the OpenTelemetry uh, documentation. OpenTelemetry takes care of a couple bits in this graph. Your, the things that you've built, your services and stuff, are probably sitting in that blue box. They're kind of your microservices, you know, your web apps or your workers or whatever. Um, and then in there, you've probably hooked into OpenTelemetry libraries. And then all these blue lines, they're part of the OpenTelemetry project. They're like the communication from it to the collector. And then the collector is like a tool that's sitting there receiving all these things, doing more processing to them, and then sending them somewhere else. That's part of the OpenTelemetry project. And where it's usually sending something is some fancy analysis program like Jaeger or Datadog or Amazon X-Ray or CloudWatch or there's dozens of them. Um, and they're not open telemetry. They're sort of, they're beneficiaries of all of this work because they all get to receive a standard system. But open telemetry, where you end up sending these things is out of scope. And that's like where all the product space is kind of happening. Okay, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit because I want to show you kind of the end result of some of this work. What I'm showing you here is a page from Honeycomb. Honeycomb is a monitoring observability service that receives open telemetry data um, and is sort of OpenTelemetry is a first-class participant. Uh, like, they built it for OpenTelemetry. Um, what you're looking at is a web app sending a message to another web app that's doing something with it. But you're seeing all of the bits inside of it. So I can't really see the colors very easily. But there's, like, purple lines there. And that's a web app that sent, that's made a bunch of database calls to its database. And it sent um, an HTTP post to some other app somewhere else on the, on the internet. It's actually on the same machine because this was a contrived example. But over the internet, you see sort of a gap in time. And you can see the web app at the other end receive that call. And then it's talking to its database as a result. Um, the, yeah, the stuff in blue is the task worker for a web app. And then the stuff in, I wrote down the colors. That was smart of me. The stuff in orange is the web app that received it and wrote it to the database. There's a couple bits of this that are basically magical. The Django views. These were, this, this is, these were two Django apps talking to each other. The Django views are automatically instrumented, so I didn't need to do anything to get that working. The database queries were automatically instrumented. I didn't need to do anything to get that working. The propagation of the trace between the two different websites um, is automatically instrumented, so I didn't have to do anything to get hap that happening. So the fact that it made a, it used Python's HTTPX library, which if you're not familiar with it, you're probably familiar with requests, which is similar and works the same for this context. Um, it inserted a little header in that that the other web app was able to go, oh, okay, that's a trace ID. And then when it sent its stuff, it was able to, the, the thing that received all the traces was able to correlate that request to that response uh, on these two apps and give you the whole picture. So all of that was magical. To get this working with two fairly convoluted web apps, I wrote one line of code. And the reason I had to write one line of code, it's, I have a little laser pointer. It's that one right there. Um, that line of code is the only line of code I had to write to get all of this working. The reason I had to write it is because this project uses its own bespoke asynchronous task library, so it didn't get automatic instrumentation from like Celery or any of those other tools. Uh, so I had to go, oh, by the way, this is where a task starts. By telling it where a task starts, it then already knew how to ha instrument database calls and it already knew how to instrument Django and it already knew how to instrument uh, SQL calls, so I got all the rest for free. So I'm going to take you through the steps of getting something like this running, and I don't know how long this is going to take, so I might finish under time and we'll have time for questions or not. The project that I used uh, to demonstrate this stuff is this one, which is uh, a Fediverse client, which is, you know, Mastodon uh, ActivityPub. Um, 
It's written by uh, a person, a bunch of people here know Andrew Goldwyn. Andrew Goldwyn is one of the Django core developers. He wrote the migration system for Django, among other things. So you, a lot of you have probably used his code before. Um, it's a useful example because it's a fairly typical web app. It has, it's a Django project. Um, it consists of a web app and an asynchronous task worker running in a separate process or a separate Docker container. And it talks in the back end to a Postgres database and Redis for caching and an object store like S3 for media. So that's a fairly typical web stack that I think a lot of us are probably reasonably familiar with. Now, this is not a very structured talk. You're probably picking up on that already. Uh, the key point that I want to tell you about OpenTelemetry is that it's pretty young and moving pretty fast and getting better all the time. So I'm going to show you how I configured OpenTelemetry last time I had to do it. Uh, I had to like create a project file, and I had to import all of these instrumentation libraries. So this first batch of code, um, I'll be testing you all on this later, so you make sure you memorize all this code. Uh, this instrumentation I had to configure for those things. What did I configure? I configured the Django, Celery, and requests in PsychoPG2 to get the SQL stuff. Then I had to set up the tracer provider. I had to handle a couple environment variables. This chunk of code, this is just all from the same file, doesn't fit on one slide. Um, I had to monkey patch into the thing because when you're sending metrics to Amazon in EMF format, it didn't correctly handle the temporality aggregation once you know what those words mean, you're already in trouble. But, um, and then I had to configure the metric exporter and stuff as well. Uh, so that was a year ago, last time I was building a project and instrumenting with OpenTelemetry. I had to do all that. Um, and you can forget that I even showed you. Yeah, I'm not going to test you on that. Like, the reason I'm showing you that is because I thought this talk was going to be longer because I was going to have to show you what all that meant. And then I set this up for Takahi, and I was like, wait. I didn't have to do any of that. The reason I didn't have to do any of that is because they're actually working on making this simpler. I had to run two commands. So I ran pip install open telemetry distro. Um, distro is like, there's, there's like, the open telemetry project is split up into a ton of Python packages. So you only sort of grab the ones you need. The distro one is the sort of, hey, let's get you up and running quickly. It downloads a couple bits and pieces, a couple useful tools. One of the tools that it downloads for you is, Open Telemetry Bootstrap, which looks into your project and will tell you exactly what instrumentations might be useful for it. It just goes through, I'm pretty sure it just goes through the pip dependencies and just grabs them all. So it found all of these ones, AWS Lambda, DB API, logging SQLite, or OLIB, blah, 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 blah. I don't actually need all of those for Takahi. It's just that because Takahi is a Django project and Django can use a whole bunch of things, uh, it kind of notices that you've got these libraries in there. In practice, for this project, I installed these ones. I installed the logging hooks, uh, Bodo Core, which once that's instrumented, basically all of your Amazon calls will get measured and instrumented and, and traced. Uh, the Django one, obviously, HTTPX, I explained before, PsychoPG, Redis, and Erlib3 for anything else that was making web requests. And then, instead of having to configure it all in the Python code and bootstrapping it, I just had to run my app with this extra command. So you, you typically start a Django app by going, you know, manage.py run server in developer mode, but like whatever binary you're using, if it's green unicorn or whatever, um, just sort of add something else to the outside of it. Say open telemetry instrument. And then in this example, I've added some command line options to tell it to send the traces to the console, send the metrics to the console, send the logs to the console, run it, uh, and I was done. And then I was like, well, this was, I, I was expecting this to be harder. And so that's what I got without editing any of the code in my project. So like we haven't touched a line of Python yet. We've just added some stuff and we're running it in this wrapper command. Um, and that gives you enough to be able to start tracing Requests, what's this one? I can't really see it that well. It is just a standard web call to the thing. So it's an API call. It's doing a bunch of SQL queries. You can see exactly how long each one of them is taking. In the tooling, I can drill down and see exactly what query it was and how long it took and stuff like that. Um, in the attributes for the web request, I can see uh, automatically instrumented, automatically added to those things are non-personally identifying information uh, like, well, 
somewhat identifying. So IP address or I think user ID can be attached but isn't by default. I think, um, you know, HTTP method, HTTP headers, uh, that sort of thing, all gets sort of attached by default. Um, so one easy way to think of this is just logging that you didn't have to do yourself. It's like doing most of it for you. That's what I got for free, but what you actually want to do is you want to spend time instrumenting your code yourself because you want to add things, you want to add the interesting bits of information to traces yourself. Uh, this is a chunk of code just demonstrating what that looks like. So the bits here that are interesting is if you're familiar with Python's logging library, you'll see something very similar here where I'm importing the tracer. I'm, cre I'm creating a tracer object at the top, just like you'd kind of make your logger near the top of your code. And then you can use it in a couple ways. Two of them I'm demonstrating here. One of them is as a context manager. So you can just say, with tracer.start as current span, you name it as a thing, and then you go, and then whatever code is happening inside of that is bound by the span. So in your trace, you'll end up seeing you know, a start point and an end point, and you can start attaching attributes to it. It has a name already. Uh, all spans have a start and end point. So in Python, the context manager is a particularly useful way of going about doing this. Uh, and then that context manager, you can also just use it as a decorator to your function, which means you just kind of get it for free right there. Anytime you call your function, it'll happen. Just that on its own is pretty handy. Uh, that's what you saw me do in that slide a couple slides earlier where, I'm not gonna go find it, I'll get lost. Uh, the one that just like went, oh, I had to go, oh, this is what an asynchronous task, this is like the outer edge of the asynchronous task. Just wrap that up in this context manager, and then all the subspans that were spawned off from that one are all nicely in that tree structure, and it just builds everything. The thing you're sending it to builds everything out of that. What you want to do is you want to add a lot of attributes to these spans. Um, one of the things that I, one of the, some of the homework I'm going to give you if you're interested in this stuff is uh, the book Observability Engineering by Charity Majors and Liz Fong Jones, and basically the people at Honeycomb, so it's partly. Well, no, it's not marketing honeycomb, but like, you know, they're into this stuff and it shows. But they have a lot to say about observability engineering in general. And one of the things they say is go really broad with what you're logging. As long as it's fast to attach to something, um, attach it all because you don't really know what's going to be useful. And you send it all and you let storage and like retention intervals and stuff like that sorted out. You let, you let your data team deal with that stuff. Um, or you just keep it for a short period of time. Like, that's a longer talk. Like, the amount of data this generates is quite high. So we'll get into that in brief later, but that's like a talk in itself. Um, but you can just attach all these attributes to it. You want, um, I end up being really quite broad with it. Like, you know, if, as long as the arguments are small or something that can just be attached to a span, you just attach it. Uh, as you can see, I've got an example right here, setting attributes um, to a span that's been open. That means that all of those will be attached to the trace as it goes up and it'll be searchable by that. Um, I think that's all I have for the traces. I'm kind of giving a, a shallow, broad view here. Metrics are the things that do counting, right? So for that, uh, it doesn't bound around pieces of code. Instead, you're tracking an event in some measurable and aggregatable way. Uh, the example that I've put here is you've got a function and you want to count whenever it does a thing. And so you're just like adding one to a counter. You create the counter globally and that counter goes up. Number goes up. That's what we want. Um, one of the big benefits of both traces and metrics using these libraries is that they don't get sent right away, right? Like all of this stuff, one of, the, one of the things you want to use a library like this for is that they all get like farmed out to a background thread and sent up. So none of this is blocking. None of this will slow down your code more than nanoseconds for the most part. Um, except for logs, I think, for a second. Um, in practice, when I'm doing this, traces have been incredibly useful for debugging and metrics have been incredibly useful for watching on production systems. So when you're playing around with this, I doubt you'll benefit heaps 
from adding a lot of metrics on your dev environment, right? Like you know how many times that function ran in your dev environment because you probably clicked the button yourself. Uh, however, traces are incredibly useful in both places. Uh, metrics are the lighter weight one to collect and traces are a bit more heavy to collect in production systems. But yeah, they, they have sort of separate use cases. Now finally, I mentioned the three types of signals that OpenTelemetry has decided it's gonna handle, traces, metrics, and logs. And logs are actually the one that they've done the least on at the moment. Um, I'm always surprised at how young this project is. Uh, I remember when I, was, you know, when I was setting up that code that I showed you before, I was getting frustrated. I was like, why is the Python code so far behind the rest of OpenTelemetry? It was like, oh, no, it's not. They, they were still pinning down the specification while I was trying to use it. I, it, was, it was newer than I thought. Um, and logs is still the thing they're trying to pin down because traces are the most valuable thing that they provide. Metrics came second, and then logs, because all, most people already have pretty good solutions for collecting their logs and sending them somewhere. So that was the lower priority for the OpenTelemetry project, as far as I can tell. The Python implementation of the logging stuff looks like uh, I tested this before coming down. I wouldn't really use it in production yet. It was hooking into the Python logging library as an additional handler. So it was still pretty easy to set up. And the auto instrumentation with an extra magic environment variable or two meant that my logs were being automatically sent up to uh, the OpenTelemetry collector, which by the way, I've ignored the other part of this puzzle so far because all of this is wire protocol stuff. All of this is like getting interesting data out of your, out of your project in a useful way and sending it somewhere. And you actually have to send it somewhere first. Um, I've experimented with sending open telemetry data directly to the services that like help you analyze it, like Jaeger or, or Honeycomb or Amazon. But in practice, you almost always want to run this extra little sidecar program, the open telemetry collector. You, you kind of want to, if you're running this in Docker or something, you probably want this agent running somewhere locally so that all of this stuff gets sent to it immediately. Um, and the agent can do the batching of a batching up of it or batching up of all the signals that you're receiving from all your other containers or pre-processing it or post-processing it or sending it to multiple backends. Uh, it's, ba it's, it's very much a Swiss army knife. You send all your signals to the open telemetry collector and then you just start deciding what to do with them from there. So, if you're going to play around with this stuff, fire one of these up, send it all to it, and like prove that it's like printing out what you get sent. It's a Go project. Uh, and one of the useful things about that means that it's basically one binary that you can download to anywhere and just like use anywhere. And it's a plugin system-based project. So there's like dozens and dozens of plugins, and all of them are just in the one binary. So it's all just about the configuration file. And the configuration file is a chunk of YAML. Of course it is. It's always a chunk of YAML. Most of my life is chunks of YAML. I see YAML when I sleep. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you, it starts off being really, really simple and uncomplicated, and you don't even need a configuration file for the basic stuff, where some sensible defaults like, it'll send it to a place called Otel, it'll print it out to the screen, this is what one looked like for a project of mine. This, the one that I was using for Takahe was a little bit more complicated because I was experimenting with different backends. I was, sending, I was sending the traces to a bunch of different places. But in this one, I was receiving all my traces via the native open telemetry protocol, which by the way, the collector can receive things in a bunch of different protocols because a lot of this stuff is all about like becoming a lingua franca, I guess. So it's like it can take Prometheus stuff or stats D stuff or collect D protocol. Like it, it supports a lot of different things. Um, so receiving all the traces via gRPC, the native open telemetry protocol, batching them up in 60 second chunks so that it'll just collect them all and then once a minute send them upstream to wherever I want to send them. And where was I sending them? I was sending them to Honeycomb. That's not actually my key. It's cool. Um, and I was sending things to the screen and I was sending the metrics to Amazon EMF. 
Uh, so that's an example of like a production use of it that actually is perfectly adequate. Uh, for developer use, there's another nice little Go tool called Jaeger, which can either be very complicated or you can use their all-in-one container, uh, which receives traces. It doesn't do metrics or logs, but it receives traces, and it's very easy to run in your local dev environment. So if you're going to play around with this stuff and do it in local development, you probably just want to spin up one of these. Um, it also, I think, can just be run as a binary, but the Docker container images, if you're, if you're a bit handy with Docker, then it's just a piece of cake to run. Um, and that is a really useful place for developer experimentation with it, and it gives you good trace searching. It keeps it all in memory. So I have this running at the moment in my Takahi setup that I set for this, and because I keep forgetting to restart it every once in a while, it just sucks up all the memory, and now the... Uh, Amazon instance where I'm running my little website is like chugging to a halt because it's using swap memory because I just need to restart the server every once in a while. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's fine. It's fine. I've decided I'm going to finish every talk that I ever give with this slide because um, I don't expect you to memorize this stuff. Like, you're not going to like go, oh, it was that command and it was that command and it was that command. Uh, what I kind of want you to get out of this talk is it's easy to start using it. Um, it's useful at the small scale and at the gigantic scale. And so instead of sort of you start with your debugging and your logging at this level, and then once you have 1,000 users, it's like, oh, I need some better way of seeing a dashboard of what they're all doing. This is still the same. Like, If you instrument your code with something like this, you can probably get away with using it at the small scale and the big scale. Um, I think you should play around with it. I think you should start instrumenting your code in ways that could turn out to be useful later. Because you never really know what you'll need to dig up out of your logs at some point. Uh, I recommend that observability engineering book. It's a pretty good one, observability engineering. If you Google that, you'll find it. Uh, learning this stuff has really helped me solve problems faster. That seems to be like what's worth it. Um, and that's kind of all I've got. So we do, I think, have a minute or two left over. And because this was a scattered, harebrained talk, I don't know if you'll have questions. This is stuff that I can like talk about for hours and hours and hours, and you'll get so bored to hell with that. But I'm sure we have time for like, a question or two. Hi. Is it possible to set up a trace that goes cross bar to bar Django requests so I can see what happens as the user goes for bar to bar to next? So the question was, can you set up a trace that will go between multiple Django requests? Now, yes. First of all, the way, the way tracing works is uh, a span has an arbitrary span ID. It's just a random number. And a trace has an arbitrary trace ID. And all you've got to do is propagate that trace ID and go, oh, start with this trace ID. So there's tooling for that. What you just described would be particularly useful if all of it's kind of happening at once. This triggers this, this triggers this, this triggers this. If there's a time delay between them, like this triggers this job, and then hours later, this one happened because the queue caught up, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't use it, you wouldn't call that the same trace, but you'd call it an associated trace. So there's a way to link, there's a way to link a trace to go, oh, by the way, this, this, is, this was triggered by this trace that happened, and provide a trace ID. Uh, you might need to invent your own mechanism of getting that in there because if it's going, for example, if it's going into a queue and then hours later it's being pulled out of a queue, you probably want to have added the trace ID to the, to the payload of the queue, to the payload that you sent to the queue. And then once you do that, you wouldn't say, oh, by the way, this is part of the same trace because I think the tooling will start to get a little bit weird if thing happens and then an hour another th later another thing happens and it tries to correlate those into one trace. All of the data stores for this tool are based on big sort of time scale DB type stuff. So all of them are kind of primary keyed by, by when a thing happened. So if you're using Honeycomb, if you're using Datadog and you want to correlate a trace, you don't want to have to search through 10 hours of your data store to find all the spans that the trace took up. Um, so the answer is yes, but you do it using a slightly different kind of way of associating things. Hi. Thanks for selecting our tree. 
And, you know, because it's pretty low of these things. What was important to you? The fact that all of the other tools are, are moving to open telemetry. Um, they, so they're not the one, like, open telemetry isn't the one that's building the analytics software. I am out of time. Uh, it's the, the, they're not the one that's building the analytics software. They're setting up the wire protocol. And although a lot of these other tools had wire protocols already, most of them are kind of going, actually, that one's pretty good. Let's just use that. And then like everyone, now that they're all just starting to use the same one, um, it's kind of a no-brainer that that's a good way to instrument your code. Uh, there's, there's some subtleties there. Like Datadog had some political things going on where like people, people got mad at them because they were like happy to receive open telemetry traces, but they wouldn't export them anymore. And then there was like, a, a bit of a community backlash over that. And I think they backtracked on it. Like I, I remember at one point, one of their documentation pages said, oh, by the way, this is deprecated. And then I reloaded it next week and it, that message was gone. It's like, oh, no, no, They're like, well, yep, this is, this is the supported way of getting open telemetry into Datadog. I'm like, oh, okay. So yeah, it's, I think it's gonna be the one that all of them are, it's gonna be the language that they're all speaking soon. I think that's it.